Is everybody having a good time so far? Well, I, I'm pretty excited. Uh, you know, for me, this is a uh, an opportunity for me to give back to a community that I've certainly drawn a lot on. And although uh, this is my first actual direct experience with uh, Icarus Interstellar, many of the folks uh, uh, who are here and, and the core of that organization and its allied organizations are folks who have mentored me and, and you'll see some of their ideas reflected in what I'm going to uh, tell you. Uh, there are a couple of things that I'm sort of obligated to, to say up front. The first is that, as you can see, I'm, I'm wearing a uniform and I am in, in, the, in the employee of the United States and the Air Force. Uh, but, but none of the remarks I'm going to make today constitute in any way an opinion or policy or position of the United States government. What it does represent is what is the state of thinking of one strategic thinker within that community that has had an opportunity to, to look at these things. And hopefully I'll show well uh, for my service in that uh, there, are, there are a range of very, very innovative thinkers across the Department of Defense and the Air Force um, and I, I was very fortunate to have this fantastic job. I, for four years, I was basically the, the chief futurist and tech scout for Air Force strategic planning in the Pentagon. And I had the, the amazingly wonderful uh, uh, job directive that I was supposed to be looking 30 to 50 years out in the future and trying to look at what would be disruptive um, that we either had to worry about or, or try to make happen in order to, uh, uh, to keep alive our values. And so unlike some of many of the, the other uh, thinkers that you've heard along the way, I'm coming from a very different perspective. I'm coming from a, a, a typically pretty conservative part of society, uh, a guardian part of society, a part of society that starts from the perspective of uh, security and, and defense thinking. And so because my, my job at that time and, and my job continues to be as a strategist, a strategist has to always think in context and what is the larger context. And certainly, if you, if you get in the habit of thinking forward about things, you start wondering, well, how far out can I start thinking about events that I need to plan for? And there, there are things, and, and uh, this talk that I'm going to give, you can also find in an online essay on Kurzweil's blog. And in there, I, I talk about a significant effect, or a significant event. And a significant event is one that really upsets your typical planning assumptions, that, that prior, you know, after that event, things are really going to be different than they, they were before. And I'm going to talk about a few of those things that, that we need to think about. I also want to just say thanks to everybody, because what you're doing and attending and, and being part of this is really significant, because ultimately, the time that you've spent over the past three days is really about the long-term survival and flourishing of humanity. And I think that's a pretty worthy way to, to spend a few days. So I first uh, got into this, this whole realm of thinking out and thinking about space uh, when I came to my job at the Pentagon in 2004. And we just had a quadrennial defense review that had asked us to, to shift a bit of our thinking and resourcing from just traditional kinds of warfare to irregular warfare and to catastrophic things. And so when I started thinking about catastrophic uh, things, it, it's not long before you sort of, particularly in aerospace, happen on particular existential threats. And there was a beautiful amount of literature that preceded me. There were some really, really forward thinkers in the Air Force that published three studies, uh, Air Force or, or Spacecast 2020, Air Force 2025, and Toward New Horizons that I was able to draw upon and start to develop a, a starting floor for my own thinking. As I started uh, thinking about strategy and strategy within the context of what the Air Force was doing, it, it clearly became apparent to me that the Air Force didn't really hold most of the cards that were important and that we were part of a much, much larger strategic ecosystem. And so I started to think about what was meaningful in terms of strategy for the nation and then what is meaningful in terms of strategy for the earth and strategy for life and the values that we that we hold dear in life. So the title of this talk is Space, a Billionaire Plan for Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And it was originally given at the ISDC, I, I think in 2008 or 9, when I was asked about how, how space could serve humanity. So first of all, I, I want to start by saying that space is not about space. 
Space has to serve our fundamental ends and interests. And those of us who are in uniform or public servants in the United States take an oath to our Constitution, which enshrines certain key things that we think are important. Of those, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and to secure the, the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And space has to fundamentally extend our values. It's the tapestry of our deepest values, the, the truths that we hold to be self-evident. And these particular things, I'm going to talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So a friend of mine is the author Howard Bloom. And I'm not going to read this quote for obvious reasons, but I think it really, really brings home the, the reality that we face out there. And you know, Howard, in his beautiful essay uh, on this, uh, uh, which is also uh, titled Creatively, uh, makes the point that Mother Nature really likes those that attempt to conquer her. And she really rewards those who attempt to stay on top and don't just sit complacently. So I think it's sort of my starting point, my starting belief, that we are destined to become a space-faring civilization. And more than that, we're destined to be the life carriers of our entire ecosystem and the clan of life that started from the very beginning. But honestly, there are a lot of things that could go wrong. And we could do it ourselves. We could do it into ourselves. We could kill our host, poisoning our biosphere. We could wait until all the resources are gone and, and we don't have the necessary energetic resources to, to get off the planet in any meaningful way. Or we could just wait so long that complacency kills us or become stunted uh, in, our, in our cultural mandate to go do these things. So I think there's a general imperative that we have to, we will and must understand ourselves, our entire world, its weather, its climate, all forms of human activity in exquisite detail and all in real time. And we are each nodes in a vast global intelligence network with intelligent feedback loops that ultimately are in an adolescent phase of, uh, of a planetary consciousness slowly bringing ourselves under control and deciding how we want to propagate to the great beyond. Now, Earth is the cradle of mankind, but we, we can't stay in the cradle forever, and unless we leave the Earth, we will surely die. And the, the most critical and, and easy reason for this is that we are, at least so far as we know right now, uh, entirely dependent on the sun or sun-like uh, energetic processes which themselves would be fuel limited. So if we want to live beyond the life of our star, we really have to be doing what this conference is all about and thinking about how we get to other stars. But on our way to getting there, there are some near-term threats that we need to think about. And the one that I've spent or been privileged to think a lot about actually is on asteroids. Uh, in, in late 2009, I held the first ever interagency uh, tabletop exercise looking at what we would do if we really had an asteroid coming at us, how we as the government would react, and, and that report is, is public. But what's amazing is how different our view of the solar system is now than probably when any of, uh, except for the youngest folks here in the audience. When I grew up, what we were taught is that basically the solar system was empty and pristine. You had planets, and you had the asteroid belt, and basically nothing in between. And, we, and really starting right about 1994, we started uh, looking for these asteroids and finding them at an amazing rate. And just this month, we passed our 10,000 uh, 10, in terms of how many near-Earth asteroids we've detected. Of course, we've detected many more in the asteroid belt itself. And of those 10,085, over uh, 861 are larger than a kilometer. And of those that we know about, um, a little, little uh, about 14%, or 1,416, are known to be in potentially hazardous orbits, meaning that they come so close that we need to watch and monitor them because they would have some chance of running into us. Now, the ones that are, are civilization killers are, uh, are in this category of larger than one kilometer. But there are a lot of smaller ones that could wreak a lot of havoc. And, uh, and asteroids as small as 40 meters are basically city killers. And there are on the order of 500 to a million of those, of which we've only found 1%. And I'll talk a little bit about what the opportunity of these are a little bit later. 
But it's only because we're looking out that we even know about these threats. Had we not had a space program, had we not had the curiosity to look behind, we would not have, have seen these. And asteroids are really the smaller, easier problem that we can go after. The larger problem for which we require a significant leap in technology is being able to divert a comet. So if, in fact, it was a comet, as many think, that uh, caused our last major extinction, we know these are typically uh, on the order of maybe six months warning time before they come plunging in uh, toward us. And there's not a lot of warning, and we don't have a deployed uh, space situational awareness system to be able to know about these reliably. And there's a huge number of bodies, perhaps a thousand planetary size bodies, some larger than the Earth, perhaps a trillion comets out there. Then it, it's a, the way uh, our galaxy works is we circle around the center, and as we come uh, through the plane of the galaxy, we come through cosmic dust storms, and we have a fairly near-term uh, threat where perhaps in as few as 2,500 years, we may pass through some dust that could have some adverse effects on our atmosphere, and that's something that's worth uh, thinking about. And I, uh, a, another friend of mine, Joel Barker, he has an, uh, uh, several wonderful quotes about the future, but this is one that I really like, that no one's got to thank you for taking care of the present if you've neglected the future. Then you never know when something's going to go wrong with yours or a neighboring galaxy and have some supermassive black hole decide to spit out and fry uh, a huge portion of your galaxy. But using space to protect civilization, providing an environment in which it's able to collectively thrive and grow to its limitless potential, that's part of what our space program needs to be about. But fundamentally, at least in, in my perspective, our space program really is not about curiosity. It's about survival. It's fundamentally about survival. And what we know is that this planet is probably only good in its current form for us for about another billion years. Once, that, once about a billion years, the sun will start expanding. It'll boil off the oceans. And so we better have a plan for what we're going to do then, unless we just don't care about our posterity. But, but at least in my view, having taken an oath to a constitution that says that that's exactly what we're supposed to be thinking about, that's kind of an unacceptable answer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do to make sure that we can lock in the full warranty of the Earth and at least make sure that we are good for the next billion years. Then you never know when there's going to be a supernova or a gamma ray burst. And they can be pretty far away, uh, as far as 6,500 light years away, and they would have obviously happened a while ago, that could strip away our ozone layer and cause a mass extinction. Um, and I guess there's a known concern within about 8,000 light years. Now, you may not be able to do a whole lot about that, but that's, that is not room for pessimism. And the, the farther you spread, the more independent places you have, the more likely you are to survive an eventuality. So you've got a number, a range of threats that we need to be thinking about proactively because the solutions to all these require time. And there's a, just like with, uh, uh, with the interest on your either positive or negative, the sooner you start investing, the time compound value of knowledge and research helps get you to these places. And so we can use time as a lever if we start early. Then there's another problem that I became very interested in when I first came to Future Concepts, and that was what a stress energy was likely to be, particularly the fossil fuel regime that we were under. And so I, I uh, searched far and wide trying to find uh, a solution that I thought would be elegant and sort of fit the, the total function, uh, value function that I was looking for in energy, something that would be green, would be infinitely scalable to global demand and demand beyond global uh, demand so that everyone could have a first world lifestyle, uh, something that would be technologically within our boundaries and our control as opposed uh, to in unstable regions. And I, I really think this quote by JFK nicely sums up uh, how we should be thinking about energy in the long run, which is that there are risks and costs to any program of action, but they are far less than the long-range costs of comfortable inaction. And there are always skeptics out there that don't believe that we'll see a, a peaking in fossil fuels because, of course, we've been able to extend uh, our ability to, to get more and more pretty well. But 
just a thought experiment on its limit. If the entire internal volume of the Earth was nothing but a giant gas tank, if you kept burning it, eventually it would all be gone. So we have this amazing resource out there, the sun. It's a, it's a working fusion reactor. Uh, it's, it's got a different principle than most of the fusion reactors. It's a gravitational confinement fusion reactor. And it puts out this amazing number that's so far in excess of the 15 or 17 terawatts we need now, or the 30 terawatts we'll need in a few decades, or perhaps the 55 terawatts we'd need for a fully developed civilization. So why not go where the energy resource is huge and constant? If you were to draw an imaginary band around uh, geostationary orbit and, and make that uh, approximately one kilometer wide, in a year, more energy flux passes through that little band than all of the oil in the ground. And the beauty is, is that it really does scale. So if we were going to provide all forms of energy, all of it, in the form of, uh, of electricity, and we were going to give everybody, we were going to let the population of the Earth grow where it thinks it's going to go to about 10 billion, we were going to give everybody the lifestyle we're enjoying here today, we'd need about 55 terawatts. And the numbers show that there are easily between 177 and 332 terawatts in geo alone. So this is a totally renewable 24-hour energy source that is only seeking the creativity of folks out there to tap it economically. And I really think that this is the Stellar app. This is the Stellar app because of all the potential goals that a space program could have, the competencies that it takes to get to a space solar power satellite really enable ev any and everything else you would want to be able to do um, in the inner solar system and, in fact, the industrial base that you would need to be able to go to the stars as well as grow the economy. So to give you an idea of how significant a, uh, uh, a move to this kind of power would be, if you're able to put 55 terawatts in orbit, you grow the global GDP tenfold. So imagine a world that is 10 times richer. And imagine a, a, uh, a, an economy that is completely self-sustaining. Now, let's talk for a minute about the scale about this, because the scale is both incredibly massive and at the same time minuscule compared to other human activity. So 50 terawatts, assuming, uh, uh, as Professor Lubin had mentioned, that we may eventually get to one kilogram per kilowatt, that gets you to about 50 million metric tons total. And if you wanted to deploy that in 10 years, that'd be about 5 million metric tons, or about 14,000 metric tons today. Well, on an annual basis, that is, or that is roughly about a level of effort that is 10 times what we did in the Berlin airlift, or, tw or approximately twice the traffic of uh, LAX in airplanes, but it is a hundredth the annual activity of, uh, of what a port like Singapore or Shanghai sees. And the, rev the revenues would be absolutely astounding. It also puts you on a path to do a lot of exciting things because if you're going to build a space solar power satellite, you're going to have to develop massive uh, launch from Earth of hypermodular systems that can self-assemble on orbit. You're going to have to have the ability to build things on orbit and of course, if you can do that, then you can build other ambitious things on orbit. You've also got gigawatts, terawatts of power on orbit in which you can do de uh, orbital debris clearing, in space mobility, uh, you, can, you can do your laser light craft to the stars eventually, it, as well as many, many uh, desirable things here on Earth. And of course, asteroid defense, the ability uh, to uh, stop dangerous weather patterns. And of course, along the way, there's, there's many, many other markets that would get developed. And it's hard to believe that once you started with that infrastructure that you wouldn't want to transition to space-based resources as opposed to bringing them up the gravity well. So when I was a, when I was a kid, I was introduced to this marvelous uh, uh, book, um, Don Quixote. And I'm sorry, it was Man and Superman. And there's this amazing quote in it, and I'm going to read this because I think it's just so beautiful. This is the life force speaking. I have done a thousand wonderful things unconsciously by merely willing to live. 
and following the line of least resistance. Now I want to know myself and my destination, to choose my path, to be able to choose the line of greatest advantage instead of yielding to the direction of least resistance. To be in hell is to drift, to be in heaven is to steer. So I, I think that fundamentally we are a frontier people and we like the idea of expansion and learning from ourselves and moving forward. And I think that there's, you know, the idea that we would want to cap our population 10 billion, I think is a terrible idea. Why would we want to limit the growth and expression of humanity when we don't have to? So a couple people have mentioned these, uh, these uh, idea of free-flying space colonies, and I think this really is the destiny of mankind. And there's this amazing quote by Jim Zimora. And he says, I'm not interested in things getting better. What I want is more. More human beings, more dreams, more history, more consciousness, more suffering, more joy, more disease, more agony, more rapture, more evolution, more life. And I am squarely in this guy's camp. I think that's where we need to go. And the, the carrying capacity is astounding. If you look at what is available in the inner solar system, it's just amazing. And let me, uh, I'm going to come back to this. I want to just sh use this chart to, to talk about this for a second. So I want to sensitize you guys to a bit of the, of the wealth that's out there because um, we, uh, I showed that initial slide as a joke about these space expedi expeditions being too expensive. But let me start off with this. There is today uh, a proposal from NASA to study a asteroid capture and return mission of something very small, seven meters, nothing that you'd have to worry about. You've got to be above uh, 30 or 40 meters to be able to e enter the atmosphere and survive reentry. That's about 500 tons. The cost to bring that back, to bring back the first one, is about 2.6 billion, to bring back the mass of the International Space Station. Now, if I needed to launch that same amount of mass into orbit, the launch cost alone would be on the order of 20 billion. The recurring, and I get a 28 to 1 mass advantage in what I have to launch up to get that back. The next subsequent mission after you've done the non-recurring uh, uh, capital is 1 billion. And so that's a 20-fold cost return uh, to go out there. Now, if I develop that technology and I start going after something a little bit bigger, a 50-meter L-class asteroid, the one, like the one that recently flew by with great fanfare on the same day that the Russians got uh, bombed by a different asteroid, in, in 2014, uh, 2014 DA-14 is estimated that it would uh, be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $130 billion in metals and $55 billion in water not counting the cost of getting it up there. Now, how many of those are up there? In that class, there are 500,000 to a million near-Earth objects of that size. Now, if you go a little bigger to 120 meter C-type, you're talking about 2 million tons. Now, what can you do with 2 million tons in Earth vicinity? You could build a rotating permanent Earth normal gravity space colony for 8,000 people, 8,000 people, and still have enough leftover material to build 12 5 gigawatt solar power satellites that each annually return 2.2 billion in revenue for a total of 26 billion. Now, note that NASA's annual budget right now is 16 billion. And that is enough mass to build 34 Daedalus class starships. That's a 120 meter single one. Now, the other asteroid that you've probably heard about, Apophis, which is about 270 meters, would allow you to build 150 5 gigawatt solar power satellites with an annual return of $375 billion in revenue. Each assuming uh, they were made of 25,000 tons of steel and silicon, as well as a Kalpana 1 style habitat that could house 100,000 off-Earth citizens. Now the next thing I have to put a bit in perspective. 
The GDP of the United States right now is about $15 trillion, $15 trillion. For the world, it's 70, but for the US, it's 15. Our debt is $16 trillion. Our annual tax revenues are 2.5 trillion. Our deficit is 1 trillion. The largest market capitalization of any company right now is Apple at 1 half trillion. Now, a single 500 meter asteroid has been valued by USGS at $5 trillion. And that, that half a kilometer across asteroid would yield 174 times the annual output of all platinum group metals and 1.5 times the total global reserves. The smallest known uh, metallic asteroid of which there are, uh, uh, there's a certain percentage, I want to say it's about 10, don't, don't quote me on that, but the, the number is there's a total of about 60,000 of them in the asteroid belt. But the smallest of them, 1986 DA and 353, 350, 3553 a moon are valued at 25, 22 to 25 trillion dollars. Now, whenever you talk to folks about this, they, wi they wisely come back and say, well, but if you dumped it on the market, it wouldn't be worth that much, right? But, but this misses the point also about what real wealth is. And so I want to point out to you that in 1880s, the most valuable metal on earth was what? Yeah. Aluminum. And aluminum now is dirt cheap, but are we less wealthy as a society because, and keep in mind that aluminum was so expensive that we put it on the top of the Washington Monument, we decorated the ceiling of the Library of Congress to be showy with it, and when foreign heads of state came, that was what they were served on instead of gold. We literally have cities made of gold, something more valuable than gold. We have aluminum structures, aluminum airplanes, aluminum cans. Are we less wealthy because we have that? No. We are incredibly wealthy because we can essentially have cities made of something better than gold. The most valuable uh, asteroid right now on Osterank is $36.36 billion. And keep in mind, there are 60,000 of these. Now, when you think about the carrying capacity here, there are two different estimates that come out of NASA studies. One is that if you gave every single human being on the order of 13 kilometers, square kilometers per person, you can still build a habitable surface area of like 3,000 Earths, 3,000 Earths. And the other carrying capacity is that the carrying capacity of the asteroid belt alone is 10 to 100 trillion people. That is 10 to 100,000 times what we currently have on Earth. So just imagine what kind of a civilization we could have just here in our own solar system. And I want to tarry there for a moment because I thought this last discussion on the panel was very interesting because if you believe that a stellar mission is going to be funded on the basis of curiosity, and keep in mind that we fund curiosity many, or a, an order of magnitude plus less than we fund fear, if you look at the NASA versus the DOD budget. But if you, if you think about this, right, uh, NASA, our curiosity budget, is about a thousandth of US GDP. And if we can build something that's ambitious, like an ISS that's, uh, you know, that's uh, roughly 500 tons, and a Daedalus class mission would be 54,000 tons, that means that proportionally you'd need a civilization that was about 100 times more wealthy than we are today. But of course, if you've got on the order of 10 to 100 tr trillion citizens, your tax revenues are going to be just fine. But of course, free flying, you know, is not the only option. There's no reason to waste a good Goldilocks zone, and we certainly should be thinking about creative ways to transform Mars. And we, we need to, first of all, make sure that Earth does not look like that, and we're able to positively manage our own climate. But then there's no reason why we should uh, let either, uh, either of our nearby planets continue to look the way they are, and we should aim to have something that looks more like that. So the pursuit. So in the pursuit of, health, of happiness, the pursuit of wealth, we are seeing an amazing explosion that as our society gets wealthy, as our, we individually have more energy available to us, as there are wealthy ci uh, uh, citizens 
that have higher concentrations of wealth and as we collectively can share our wealth in ways like Kickstarter uh, to do the things we want, we are building for ourselves ever increasing access. And those who say it can't be done are usually er interrupted by others doing it. So how long is it going to be till we're going to have a completely commercial uh, cislunar system that's going to be a real railroad as opposed to something that's just built for the government and by the government? And as I said, there is a tremendous amount of wealth out there. In fact, and this is an old statistic, but if you were going to try to divide the, the wealth of our inner solar system among all of us, the NASA study said that basically if you divided it a hundred, uh, if you divided it among all six billion people that they had at the time, uh, the, the wealth of the asteroid belt would mean that each of us would have a hundred billion. I, I could think of a few things I could do with a hundred billion. But when you think about what's going to drive you here, it's really important you pick your goals right and right from the start. And it's not necessarily the intuitive way. I would argue that if you really want to colonize and terraform Mars and get to another uh, 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 stellar system, you don't start by sending human beings to Mars. You start by building space solar power satellites. Take a look at this. This is a logarithmic scale. And these are all the different potential drivers of space launch. This is courtesy of Ivan Becky. But this line right here, space solar power satellites, and the amount of uplift that is required and what it delivers back down to you, that's what's really going to turn us into a spacefaring civilization, into a space industrial society that can do great things. And eventually, you know, after the initial non-recurring cost, it's going to go up and we'll be able to build these beautiful internal volumes. Luckily, you know, when you poll the public, they're, they're ahead of where our actual policy is. If you look over two different administrations, building solar power satellites and developing planetary defense was the top. So it's kind of curious that they're not part of our program right now. But the reason is, of course, that we have a vision for space exploration, but we have no vision for space development. Nor do we have a funding line in any of our organizations for that. So eventually, we're going to have a continuous Earth to space infrastructure that's going to be able to let us come and go at relatively low expense. There are a lot of potential candidates out there. We heard a couple to, uh, in the past couple days. And we have got a bright future, you know, a future that's going to, you know, have all these different characteristics. You're going to have free flying colonies. You're going to have uh, the ability to divert stuff. You're going to be doing terraforming. You're, you're, you've got a stellar probe up there. By the way, this is a graphic from the uh, 2007 uh, Pentagon Space Solar Power Study, which I would recommend to you. Then there's this, the the stewardship, the, able, the ability to protect and buffer the Earth from the awesome winds of change. And here again, if you've never read Jim Oberg's fantastic essay, um, he has this amazing line. He says, the universe threatens us, we resist. To refrain from taking action in defense of Earth's biosphere, using the fear of our ignorance as an excuse is, I argue, an abdication of our responsibility to our planet and to our nation and to our children. And eventually, you know, we, uh, we may outgrow this particular form. Our children may be children of the mind. Maybe we will transcend as some thinkers like Kurzweil talk about in the singularity. Maybe we'll choose to live in a second life in some kind of a solar server farm. But we may still want to grow our creativity. And if we do, then we'll want to think about how we co-opt larger amounts of resources to do very ambitious things. We may want to create world ships because we value our biology and our heritage and our ecosystem. And we want to send that on. And of course, there's what we're here to talk about today. The extrasolar planets, the HAB stars. And I would argue that we don't necessarily care in, in this paradigm whether or not there are planets that are Earth-like. We care about whether or not there are rocky materials that we can make into large internal volumes and harvest the solar energy in order to continue our, uh, our flow of life. And there's a whole galaxy that's our first stepping stone to explore. And even if we were going to go slow at 0.1c and take 500 uh, years at each location, the numbers show that we could basically people the, or get to the entire galaxy within like a half million years. So while a billion years is certainly what we have to be planning for, and what I think we may unfortunately be planning for, because I think that the, the nature of our 
of our society is to sort of wait until a threat is imminent and proximate to do anything about it, there is no reason we need to. And I think that we cannot help but go in different and creative, interesting directions. And Bruce Sterling, if you've never read Schismatrix, a wonderful book, he's got this great line that a successful species always bursts into a joyous wave of daughter species of hopeful monsters that render their ancestors obsolete. Denying change meant denying life. And I think this is something to be celebrated ultimately, that we will have children that will be tremendous in their diversity. Think about how sad it would have been if any of our ancestors had said, hey, microbe, why don't you stay in the pool here? You know, fish, don't, don't walk up on land. You might change. You might grow legs. You know, don't leave Olduvai Gorge. We might look different in a few millennia. But I think that we're learning to draw our circle of inclusion larger and to learn that that diversity uh, uh, makes us more interesting. So to learn about other stars and planets is to learn about our own, and we need to be reaching for those farther destinations. And I personally think that there are handles yet on the universe undiscovered that will allow us to do this with greater ease. So I think that we either need to find a way or make one. And so the mantra that I think is very important is, uh, and feel free to repeat after me, this is uh, Lee Valentine's tagline, but this is fantastic. Mind the sky, protect the earth, settle the universe. And so that, I, th I think with that, I'm out of time. I could talk for more time, but I'm not going to. If you want to read the full essay, it's on Kurzweil, and, and here is a site where there's some other writings there. Uh, but the basic, basic plan is lock in the full warranty of the Earth, solve our energy and asteroid problems that will let us prosper for another billion years. In that time frame, grow the inner solar system to a much larger civilization, build out the infrastructure that we need to do more ambitious things, taking us to the stars, and then settle the universe.